This is a special presentation of Farm Journal Television. Today's farmers have high-tech equipment, from tractors to GPS to the hybrids fighting for every bushel. Here to help is agronomist Ken Ferry. There's definitely some things we put into our systems pyramid. And agronomist Missy Bauer. So we're trying to create that true V trench. And they're using the systems approach to higher yields on every acre. I'm Clinton Griffiths, and she's Margie Fisher. Together, we're Corn College TV. Corn College TV, brought to you by Winfield. Uncovering insights through data to help farmers be greater. Visit your local retailer or learn more at winfield.com. And by Microessentials, the next generation of fertilizer for the next generation of farming. Good morning, thanks for joining us for Corn College TV. This morning, we're gonna be discussing yield maps, which is why we're starting inside with Missy Bauer. Missy, let's, let's talk about yield maps, a pretty important tool for us. That's correct, and there's a lot of uses for yield maps, and I think that's one of the things we wanna to try to get across today, because um, utilizing yield maps in your combine um, sounds like an easy thing, but you gotta take time to get things calibrated and really do a good job. Uh, but I think growers will do that if they realize how valuable that they really are. Yeah, and how do they work for us as a tool? Well, one of the tools it can help us do, if we look at these yield zones, it can really help us identify management zones. And we've talked about management zones in the past, about how important that is to understand the variability that's out in our field and manage it by that variability. So the yield map becomes kind of the, the initial thing or the initial foundation for helping to get that established out in the field. Okay, uh, and I guess you have uh, some other things that will help us do as well, not just, you know, letting us see the different soil types out there. You know, a lot of times it could help define problems too. Maybe it's drainage issues that you have. A lot of people have used yield maps to identify where to put tile in, things like that. So uh, maybe it's fertility issues or pest issues, but there's a lot of uses for these yield maps if we kind of take the time with them uh, and, and try to get things right. Mm. Uh, what we find is that they can really help what we call define these management zones. If we take a look at this map here, you can see there are a lot of uh, variety in the, in the yield, green being good, red being bad in this field, but because they're so fine-tuned, we can really get these kind of separated out through here, the good from the bad. And then we can go out and pull soil samples separately in these different areas and try to see is it something fertility-wise that we can manage in the soil itself. Okay. Another case what we'd have is maybe you have some sort of management zones or soil types that are out there. So this is an example where we got some different soil types out in the field and then we brought in a new uh, yield map into here and we can see that maybe we could take these zones and fine tune them. Okay. So if you look at this spot here, um, this ground through here is typically kind of a lower ground and, and uh, yields quite well through here. Although this is the same soil type, you can see that we got different yield in here. So this is being lower yield next to this uh, better, uh, higher yields here. So what I'd like to do in this field is actually separate this out where I'm going to kind of fine tune this area out of here and separate that so I'm not blending these two production areas together anymore. Okay, so you can really go in and fine tune your map and, and really narrow down on the focus. That's correct, and it'll just help create better management zones uh, overall for you to be able to use. But if we're going to do this type of, of thing with our yield data and really use it and try to define things like this in, in our management zones, then we need to make sure we take the time to calibrate it properly. Pretty important. Yeah, if you look at your maps and you feel like your maps don't show you much, like here's an example of a poorly calibrated map, and it just looks like a random blur of colors. Right. You right. can't see much uh, definition, much pattern there, and that's uh, because this was not calibrated properly, which we'll talk about here in, in a little bit later today, but this poor calibration just isn't going to show us these fine-tuned areas. Let's take the same field now and show a year that it was calibrated properly. Wow. Wow. Really jumps out at you. You can see the greens versus reds. Very that, defined. That's correct. And, and this is what we're looking for. So if your yield maps look like this, then you probably are doing a better job of actually calibrating. But we want to separate out these areas of low yield from, the, from this higher yield and be able to manage those uh, separately as we go forward. Okay. Um, and, and we've talked before about NDVI and what it can do for us, but it, it kind of falls into that same idea of yield map. That's correct. So an NDVI is that aerial imagery. Um, and what we're trying to see here is, again, the crop itself. You know, here it's green is good and red is poor. Uh, but these maps, kind of in combination with our yield maps, can be really powerful to help break down these management zones even more. Okay. Uh, and, and this really all goes to a foundation for being able to manage these zones and really improve our yields over time. Yeah, so it's the foundation for variable rate. 
So that variable rate is kind of the heart of where we could go maybe with populations, uh, planting populations, as well as maybe nitrogen uh, as well. So having the foundation, the yield map to help create the management zones out in the field and then be able to allow us to implement more variable rate uh, is, is really what we can do with it. So if we utilize the information we have, it can be very powerful. No, the main thing is we've got to make sure we have it calibrated well and then take a look at it. That's correct. Still ahead, Ken talks inputs and the difference between inhibitors and additives. But up next, using NDVI and thermal mapping for management. There are 406 million acres of cropland in the U.S. Winfield is helping to make them work harder. Maybe the answer isn't a new product, but a new way of thinking. A way to turn data into something you can harvest, driving efficiency into every molecule. It's time to rethink what a business partner can be. It's time to be greater. Winfield. You don't just see a field. You see the future of your operation. One we're helping you protect. Enlist is a new herbicide tolerant trait system that will build on glyphosate. Improving performance to move farming ahead. Over the generations, fertilizer, the unsung hero of the farm, has been in the background quietly nourishing crops with very little fanfare. Until now. Meet the next generation of fertilizer. Micro Essentials. Ken, whenever we're looking at our yield maps, there, there are some other technologies out there that can really help us, maybe mid-season, not waiting all the way to harvest. That's right. A, a yield map, of course, is a phenomenal tool because it tells us what happened and we can verify that. But other tools such as NDVI can be used to give us a heads up. So this tells me what happened. I can look at the same field during the, during the NDVI shot and I see the same problem areas, but now I see them clear back here in July, not in September. So I can make a visit to that field and I can, I can try to figure that out. This is collected with an airplane, could be collected with a satellite. And this image right here is also collected NDVI, but it's done on a toolbar. So when the, when the nitrogen toolbar went through, their cameras are on the toolbar and it collected an NDVI map. As soon as I was done side dressing nitrogen or spraying, whatever I did out there in the field and collected this map, I could go back out to that red spot and verify what that problem was. Okay. Thermal imaging the same way, but it's a little bit different. Thermal imaging is taking a temperature of the crop. So NDVI, the crop gets sick, let's say, and it finally starts to change its reflected values and then it shows up. So this is under stress and it's already causing yield. Thermal imaging is taking the temperature and it's telling you the crop that's starting to get sick. So this thermal imaging could pick up in, uh, insect infestations or early disease pressure. Anything that anytime the plant has a little bit of stress, its temperature starts to rise. Okay. So as we look at this thermal image, Blue means cool, yellow means uh, warm, and this is a shot with an airplane. The thermal image said these are the warm spots on this pivot. And we come back uh, two weeks later, and these are the warm spots on the pivot. And three weeks later, the, these are red spots. That corn is stressed. Now what we're able to do here is to make a variable rate irrigation map. We need to put more water on these sand hills to uh, salvage them because our water rate isn't high enough for them. So by being able to see this thing, through a thermal image, we can see it before this corn actually physically shows it, which an NDVI would show, and it can actually see it before a yield monitor gets there to tell you what it actually is. So it's really using all of these in concert, trying to give you the best picture throughout the whole year, and each one is giving you the same thing, but different times of year different in a little bit different way. And there may be certain situations, such an irrigation or maybe nitrogen, where you have time to react, so you can use that information. 
when we get to a yield map, it's time to evaluate and think how you would react for next year because it's too late. So all different layers within it and more and more layers seem to be coming all the time. So it gives, a, it gives us a lot better bird's eye view of a whole crop. And this is important, the more acres we farm, the harder it is to scout. And it's not a passive tool, it can be an active tool, right? That's I mean, right. we see it, we can go see if there's something we probably can do the, about it. Probably the, one of the major things it does, it tells us where to look. I could walk into this field, walk in here and come out, and I would not realize that I got some corn in trouble. So a situation when I have a this kind of data in front of me, I can download that on my iPhone or put it on my iPad and I can walk to that spot to verify what's taking place. Absolutely. We've been out to this field, this spot right here, the corn is waist high and here it's shoulder high and, and it's reflecting stress. It just, we aren't keeping enough water on that sand. Still ahead, building the foundation for variable rate. But up next, a lesson in monitor calibration. Corn College TV, brought to you by Avail Phosphorus Fertilizer Enhancer. Supercharge your phosphorus this fall with Avail to maximize the use of your fertilizer investment in the spring. Supercharge your pea with Avail Phosphorus Fertilizer Enhancer. Studies show that when you add Avail to your fall applied phosphorus, you can see an average increase of 9.9 .9 bushels of corn per acre. Avail reduces phosphorus fixation to promote more efficient pea uptake to the crop for stronger roots, better overall plant health, and higher yields. Supercharge your pea this fall with Avail Phosphorus Fertilizer Enhancer to maximize the use of your fertilizer investment in the spring. Ask your fertilizer dealer for details today. Hey, what's going on? Just checking the fields. Yours are looking pretty good. Unless you're doing something right. Actually, I got a guy. You got a guy. Well, it's not just any guy. I got a channel seedsman. Channel, yeah. Yeah, I've been working with him pretty close to get what you can see for yourself. This is what I'd recommend. Let's get to work. Now this is what you want to see. Maybe I should get a guy. Maybe you should get a channel seedsman. Find your channel seedsman at channel.com. here today is calibrating a yield monitor. The yield monitor calibration has several different steps and depending on the model or the brand of yield monitor that you have, some of these steps may vary. But as a rule of thumb, we always want to make sure we do these in the proper order. So we always start off with a vibration calibration. So this is when the head's down and in the running position um, at full speed, then through the monitor we'll click on and do a vibration calibration. The second step then is setting our stop height. What that is, is when you come to the end of the field and you raise up, at what height do you want your GPS to shut off? So you set that in the monitor. The third thing that we do is a distance calibration. This is where we'll measure out 400 feet, uh, set flags at each end, actually drive that distance and see how it correlates back to what the combine said. If it's not exact, then we go through a calibration process for that as well. The fourth thing that we do is make sure we do a temperature calibration. Uh, this is going to take place by measuring the temperature of the grain itself. And we would again just adjust that in the monitor up or down. The two main important parts of our calibration are going to be calibrating for moisture and grain weight. For the moisture, what we're going to do is start a new load in the combine and the monitor, uh, harvest uh, several thousand pounds, auger it out, catch the samples, and then test those samples. We're going to test usually about five different samples um, and take an average of that. Then we're going to plug that moisture number into the monitor itself and accept that, and that will calibrate the moisture of the combine for the grain. The next thing that we want to do, our last step, is going to be calibrating for grain weight or flow. We're going to achieve this by running different speeds out in the field. So if I want to teach this yield monitor what low yields are and what high yields are, I'm going to do that by changing uh, the flow through the combine, i.e., in this case, I'm going to drive slow, simulating low yields. I'm going to drive faster, simulating faster uh, speeds. So there are a lot of charts you can use to calculate the exact speeds that you uh, want to run. Uh, but as a rule of thumb, you kind of target your middle. You're going to have a couple faster speeds and a couple slower speeds. Uh, once we do that, then we're able to uh, enter those actual weights. So you need a grain cart with scales on it or a, a weigh wagon that you can weigh that out. And then we're actually going to plug the actual numbers into the monitor. So now that we've ran our, our moisture calibration here, we've tested our samples and we got the average that we're going to go ahead and punch in here. So we're in our main run screen. We're going to go ahead and get into our calibration screen for the moisture. And this particular load in the combine had it at 25 
25.9 and our actual moisture was 25.3. So we'll go ahead and we can click that number in there and then that actually gets us calibrated for the moisture. So now we're getting ready to actually calibrate for grain weight or flow. And what we're going to do with this particular uh, yield monitor is we're going to run five different calibration loads at different flows. We've done some calculations with some charts and we're going to run different speeds to achieve the different flows for this monitor. So in order to do that, when we get ready to run our first one, we need to start a new load or a new region in the monitor. So we're going to go ahead and click on that and start a new, new load and we're going to call it C1 for calibration load number one. Once we get this in here then, we'll be able to go ahead, we're going to harvest our first speed. It's calculated at about one and a half mile an hour. So we're going to go down and make sure we get at least 4,000 to 8,000 pound loads to do that. So we'll run that pass and once we get the weight from that, which we're calculating off our grain cart here that has scales on it, we'll be able to plug those numbers in here. Once we've run our five different calibration loads at the different speeds, we'll be able to go ahead and enter in the actual weights that we had from the scales on the cart itself. So again, we're just gonna do that in our calibration screen, and you can see where we've actually entered these in um, and, and punched e each of them in. Once the five loads are entered in, then it's just a matter of hitting your perform calibration button. But the key here is running different loads at different grain flows. We're achieving that by running different speeds with this combine. Depending on the type of monitor you have, maybe it only requires to do a couple calibration loads at a standard flow and a low flow. But this particular yield monitor, we'd run five loads in order to achieve that to get good calibration. When we're talking about nitrogen, we're usually talking about inhibitors, uh, additives or something that you usually add to a fertility uh, product to, to maybe make it more efficient, uh, make it uh, less tie up. But when we talk about nitrogen, we're usually talking about inhibitors that would either stop the urease process uh, from urea nitrogen volatilizing and leaving as a gas, or they would slow down or stop the denitrification leaching process, and that means they stop nitrification. Definitely as a farmer picks out what type of inhibitor he's going to use, he's got to be uh, sure that he's looking at using the right inhibitor with the right product. Using a nitrification inhibitor to stop volatility would be a mistake, or using a volatility inhibitor to stop nitrification would be a mistake. So they got to know the inhibitor they're using and match it up to the product that they're using and the timing. Um, but there, there could very well be uh, money spent on an inhibitor and it would be the wrong one if they didn't do their homework. Corn College TV is sponsored by the Enlist Weed Control System from Dow AgroSciences, a new herbicide and trait system that will build on glyphosate. You don't just see a field. You see the future of your operation. One we're helping you protect. Enlist is a new herbicide tolerant trait system that will build on glyphosate. Improving performance to move farming ahead. There are 406 million acres of cropland in the U.S. Winfield is helping to make them work harder. Maybe the answer isn't a new product, but a new way of thinking. A way to turn data into something you can harvest, driving efficiency into every molecule. It's time to rethink what a business partner can be. It's time to be greater. Winfield. The foundation for variable rate can very well be your yield map. Ken, what kind of information can we learn from that data? Well, we have to ground truth it. So we take our yield maps and our NDVI photos and they tell us where to look. And then we got to go to the field and ground truth it and figure out what is it in the field situation that's, that's causing the yield separations that are out there in the field itself. So we go out to the field and we dig up some plants. What are we showing here in these examples? Well, in this example here, this field has had the same nitrogen rate across the whole thing. But the yield map tells us some of the field is yielding quite a bit more than others and we want to identify why. 
When we get out there, we recognize it is a nitrogen deficiency in the areas that aren't performing consistently that's holding us up. So as we look at this plant, even though it's got the same rate of nitrogen, we see nitrogen drawdown down here at the base. So okay. we start with nitrogen starts at the tip, <clears throat> moves down the midrib of that leaf. This plant is cannibalizing itself uh, at a pretty heavy pace, while its counterpart in the other parts of the field that are in good shape uh, still has these bottom leaves on and there's no firing within it. Not showing that deficiency. That's right. So we have a nitrogen issue that is, is shifted not only the, the health of the plant, it's shifted the maturity. So if we look at the ear set, we're just a white blister. Uh, in this situation, we're not that far away. This one is so healthy, it's trying to throw on a double ear. So there's so much nutrients available to right. it. And we got quite a difference in the ear itself. <clears throat> so we're gonna say this is a drastic nitrogen deficiency that's gonna hamper yield. So in this situation here, we've even changed the maturity of the crop from this yellow corn to this white corn. So this would encourage us to consider variable rate zone management. That's right. So we have to figure out, we have to manage that nitrogen better in that area because a plant is running out. Now in this case, it happens to be lack of mineralizing nitrogen, meaning that it, by taking soil tests, we found out that this soil can mineralize almost 100 more pounds of nitrogen than this one can. So if I want to fix this problem, I flat got to put more nitrogen on there. So it's going to trigger a variable rate application. We're going to move some of this nitrogen to that part of the field to bring that buffer back out. In other cases, it may be the fact that uh, that area has a high loss factor, high risk factor. Then we may have to change our timing as well as our variable rate to make sure that we have nitrogen that's out there either at different stages or protected in the field itself. Thanks, Ken. So the baseline for a variable rate nitrogen in your field. Yep. Got to ground truth it. Hey, what's going on? Just checking the fields. Yours are looking pretty good. Unless you're doing something right. Actually, I got a guy. You got a guy. Well, it's not just any guy. I got a channel seedsman. Channel, yeah. Yeah, I've been working with him pretty close to get what you can see for yourself. This is what I'd recommend. Let's get to work. Now this is what you want to see. Maybe I should get a guy. Maybe you should get a channel seedsman. Find your channel seedsman at channel.com. It's time to demand more. With microessentials, you get more from every acre. Through our fusion technology, only microessentials combines four vital nutrients into one powerful granule, ensuring uniform nutrient distribution and increased nutrient uptake. The innovation behind our fusion technology means you'll grow stronger, healthier plants. Microessentials, get more from every acre. Probably the first concern we'd have in a year like this would be herbicide carryover. And you want to take a good look at what the half-life of the herbicides that you used out there and when they were applied. Our highest risk herbicides are going to be those that were applied this summer, especially on our non-GMO beans uh, that we use things like uh, the ALSs or the diphenyl ethers or PPOs that uh, to manage weeds other than the Roundup application. You want to think about sampling some of those fields, maybe even doing some grow outs. We like to do grow outs with oats. Oats is kind of the canary in the minefield, I guess you would say, is it, it'll show trouble before a lot of other crops. But I think uh, carryover is going to be a concern for 2013 just because a lot of these products that we use, they need water and microbial activity to break them down, to degrade them and, and get rid of them. So uh, I would I would check the lap areas in a field, places where you know that are doubled up, they're your high risk areas, check them first. Uh, and then if you see problems there, move on out in the field and check some areas out in the field of the lighter soils, places that wouldn't hold as much water. And uh, make sure we don't have any surprises before next year.